Hello, this is Rogira, and I'm joined with my friend Amadeus Dredd to look at Frankenstein. Oh, um, hi everyone. I'm, I'm com- coming back to do a commentary after some leave of absence for health reasons, but uh, I'm pretty much fit to sort of like do a commentary today. And fortunately, I think this is going to be the last one we're going to do this month, but. Uh, but, um, oh well, you know, uh, so just life goes, I guess. And, and uh, well, for me personally, I'm quite a huge fan of uh, Kenneth Branagh. And I like his Shakespeare films, such as Hamlet and Henry V. And what he wanted to do with this film here was he wanted to make a film that was more ac- accurate to the original book by Frankenstein. Sorry, uh, the original book of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, hence the title Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, As opposed to taking just... You, you haven't read the book, Rod? No, no, I, I've never read the book. Um, and in fact, uh, what, if I have to be honest, this is probably the only Frankenstein movie I've actually seen. I haven't even seen the Boris Karloff movie. Um, I've seen uh, one or two of the others over the years, and I've read a graphic novel version of the book, and this film pretty much reflects what I read in that book. And, and I think it might have been quite jarring for some people to see because they were sort of like used to whole image of oh Frankenstein does the monster the monster's evil has got like those sort of like uh, electrical bolts in his neck whereas this film sort of like didn't have any of that and just sort of like tried to focus more on how the book was told and and I, and I guess some people didn't take to that which is why the film had quite like a the negative reaction at the time when it first came out. Well, see, it's interesting you mention that because uh, I was only a kid when I saw it, and I believe I'd seen uh, Dracula beforehand, and so that movie I found a bit better, uh, even though it's sort of got a lot of scenes where it's going over the top of your head. But I think I found this a bit boring. But, uh, you know, as an adult now, obviously I can see it with different eyes, and um, I have a feeling that I'll probably like it a lot more now. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's not a film without its flaws. I mean, I think it does have one or two, one or two maybe pacing issues and and a couple of scenes that maybe do drag on for too long. But uh, but aside from that, I, I don't really have that many complaints of it. And in fact, whenever I watch it, I think, you know, what is wrong with this film? What what is what, why do people hate it so much? And it's like, but I guess people just weren't ready for sort of like a a serious departure from the traditional image of Frankenstein that they had in their minds. Yeah, it sort of gets ingrained in people's memories and also their um, idea of what what things should be, how they should look, and that kind of thing too. Exactly, yeah. And and at the beginning of the book, as with the beginning of this film, we've got um, the explorer the explorer character played by Aidan Quinn who's trying to reach the North Pole and he meets Frankenstein which which actually what happens in the book is they spot Frankenstein from their ship with a team of huskies whereas obviously in this beginning they ran aground and they're trying to dig the ship out and that's funny you mentioned too with Frankenstein now a lot of people think that the monster is named Frankenstein and I know there's some people that say, well, technically it still is Frankenstein because it's, you know, Frankenstein's created him in his image sort of thing. And um, I sort of think of it, well, you know, it doesn't really bug me if someone says, you know, Frankenstein is the monster, but, you know, h- how do you feel about that? Uh, I think it's a common mistake. And... In my opinion, the monster is the monster. I don't think it's it's technically Frankenstein. I mean, uh, to me, to me, that doesn't really make much sense, to be honest. Yeah, which is fair enough. And uh, you know, I, I sort of look at things from from my past, like uh, Castlevania, and that, and seeing the Frankenstein's monster. And yeah, you sort of get that idea in your head of what Frankenstein should be. No, obviously Sir Kenneth Branner is Victor Frankenstein and Br- Branner is actually a bit of a 
a divisive actor. Some think he's over the top, others think he's a very good actor. Me personally, I think he's a, sort of like a very talented actor with quite a bit of Shakespearean background. And I think he's a pretty good director as well. Yeah, see, I haven't really had much experience with his uh, his work, really. So for me, it's sort of like, um, I, I, I guess I'm a bit more open-minded than some people who hate him, you know, if they do hate him, might be. Uh, he, he seems very confident, like, as, as an actor, I'm, you know, Shakespeare, too, he's, he's done a lot of that, obviously, and so that's something that isn't just, you know, anyone can just pick it up and just be instantly good at it. I think um, one thing maybe people don't like is the fact that this like could be seen as more of a tragic drama instead of a straight-up horror film, when they are kind of maybe forgetting the point of the original story was that it was meant to be a tragic drama. It's just over the years with the Boris Karloff film and the uh, more famous adaptations like the I'm a Horror series of films, that's sort of like... In a lot of people's minds, as you said, well, that's what Frankenstein is meant to be, whereas uh, Branagh wanted to sort of like go back to the source material and sort of like tell the story how, how it was originally written. And it's interesting too, if anyone has seen it, there's actually a series called Prophets of Science Fiction and they look at different um, authors or directors and, and writers and that kind of, of thing and look at what they predicted and, and things that were in their stories that came true and, and all that. And uh, they actually did, uh, one of them was on uh, Mary Shelley. And it was quite interesting to find out some details about her life and, and that. And I think that one of the reasons she wrote the book was because she wanted to show her, col like her friends, her peers, who were also, some of, some of which who were also writers, wanted to show them that she could come up with a really, you know, a really interesting horror story or, or, you know, something like that. And she drew a lot of inspiration from certain things of her life as well. Yeah, and um, in this film, we get more of like a, uh, a backstory for um, uh, Victor Frankenstein as well. It sort of, like, shows his early life when he was younger. And, you know, just before he went off to... Study in Geneva. Yes, Geneva, yeah. Stu study in Geneva at university. And these scenes show him as a small child living his idyllic life. Which I, which I think is quite important because it like, shows who Frankenstein was uh, before he became an adult and messed everything up for himself. <laughs> now, this actress here, I knew, I, I, I knew where I saw her before. She was in the first Highlander. She's actually Connor's... Uh, girlfriend, um, you know, who's in the village, and she's one of the ones that wants to banish him when they find out that they think he's the devil. Yes, yeah, Celia Imri is her name. Oh, is it? Yeah. I think she's like, he's in league with Lucifer, <laughs> was, the, was one of the things that she said in that. that yeah. yeah, that was her. She's sort of like uh, quite like a big name over here in England. Cool. Done lots of films and TV work. And of course, too, we can't forget we had Ian Holm as well. As Frankenstein Senior. <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> Although, whenever I, whenever I watch uh, these films, I sort of like can't help but think. <laughs> sort of like, I mean, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but uh, whenever I watch like this film and sort of or when I was reading the Frankenstein story, I thought to myself, if you've got a name like Frankenstein, which is, to me, sort of like a bit of like a sinister, evil-sounding uh, name, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, you're going to do, you're going to do something in life where everything is just going to go wrong for you. <laughs> like, just, like, to me, the name Frankenstein is just sort of like, to me, is just sort of like a, a creepy sort of name that, that, like, a normal person wouldn't be given. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's got some very, uh, you know, sinister kind of, of connotation to it. But I mean, looking at this movie now, like now as an adult, 
I, I can kind of see why some people would be like, you know, get to the, get get to the good stuff, you know, get to the the thing. But as you said, you know, with that scene where he's a kid, it's good to get these sort of flashbacks and that, and also to see a bit of his life, uh, where he's looking like he's very, you know, um, sociable and and that kind of thing. He's not, you know, some recluse uh, or anything like that. You sort of get the sense that he's got a lot of, um, you know, social. Um, skills, you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, it creates a good contrast for later on. Um, this film does leave out one element that I would have maybe liked. I think, because um, in the graphic novel I read, uh, that there's a, there's a like, whole chapter where I think it's Frankenstein's younger sister she gets, she gets, uh, she, she gets into trouble with the law, and she gets judged and she gets executed, which sort of like has a lot of like good character development. Frankenstein, and he uses parts of, of his dead sister to uh, <laughs> make a bride for for the monster. Oh, okay, so that's what well, went into the bride, or, or partly. Of... Yeah, which, 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 which I thought was a uh, sort of like a really like proper grisly sort of like really tragic, and yet at the same time kind of. Uh, twisted elements of the story, which I really liked, and I think this film leaves that out. Like I don't remember, I don't think there's any sort of like trial scene or anything like that in this film. And whereas for me personally, I would have uh, personally liked to have to have seen that uh, scene put into this film. And obviously here we get uh, his mother dying in childbirth, which sort of like in- inspires him to find the find the answer to to death he wants to stop death he wants to save those he loses like he wants to put a stop to it yeah it's funny you mention that because that's obviously a thing that's used in uh, Star Wars with Anakin George Lucas decided to use that as a um, one of the reasons why he wanted to learn you know the, the dark side of the force because it could lead to him being able to stop people from dying you know, and it's interesting when characters sort of have this defining moment. You know, Batman has his when he's a kid. You know, it's the defining moment that sets a character on a certain path. Yeah, and uh, Frankenstein has his. And it's interesting, of course, you know, spoilers, but him succeeding in this you know, is, is sort of like a, a pretty a pretty cool thing in, in concept, if you know what I mean. But how he got there and, and that kind of thing is obviously, uh, you know, a different... That's where a lot of moral sort of things come into play. I mean, like there he said, I will stop this, I will stop this. And now, I, I think one of the key themes of this story is obsession. Like, he's just obsessed. He's obsessed to, like, do whatever it takes to stop death. Yeah, and it's that obsession that fuels him to keep him going and sort of that drive and determination not to, uh, you know, stop what he's doing and just go, oh, well, I give up now. Of course, here we have Helena Bonham Carter. Yep, uh, pre annoying, annoying fame days, which I like to think where this is all like before she started playing the same role in every film she was in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I thought she was I great in right. Tricks. Yeah, in Harry Potter, yeah, and uh, I don't know, I just think had she like done more roles like this, she would have to me been a more interesting actress, but. Now she's just coughing and quirky in everything that she does. Yeah, it's interesting, like, because uh, obviously she was married to Tim Burton for a while, and, and they've divorced now, and, and that's which is not, you know, it's like neither here nor there for me. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, think, I, I didn't think, that, I didn't think, that, I didn't think they were married. I think they were just, uh, just domestic partners. Oh, they could have been. So it shows how much I really pay attention to that kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> but. Um, 
So it might be a case too, like with uh, Tom Cruise, I think, and Katie Holmes, where, you know, sort of wanted to, you know, restrict, maybe not intentionally 100%, but restrict what sort of roles that were done. You know, and maybe Tim Burton with Helen, they wanted, wanted her to do more sorts of, you know, those quirky roles. Kind of like, oh, you should do these. They're more suited to you or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Now, I don't really know if it's <laughs> just how much, like, of a plausible basis there is for, uh, uh, like, electricity, sort of, like, bringing a dead thing back to life. I mean, obviously, they use electricity on CPR machines in, in hospitals and, and stuff like that, but, uh, but I'm not... <laughs> but I, I think, um, uh, for, for it to be decided, like, just how much... How, how possible, like... Like what, what Frankenstein wants to do in this story is, is for someone else to sort of like decide. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm in the same boat too because you, you see stuff like this in movies and you sort of take it for granted in the sense that you just believe it when, when you see it because, you know, you've got the context of what's happening in the story. But when it comes to actually thinking, hmm, in reality, you know, how, how much weight does this actually carry <laughs> and validity? <laughs> Oh, it's interesting as well because uh, Ian Holm worked with Kenneth Branagh multiple times on other projects such as uh, uh, Henry V. And can't remember if he was in Hamlet. I think he was in Hamlet. And I don't know how Ian Holm is because here he's quite quite a bit old. I mean, I, he's just one of those actors who's been like acting forever, really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I think this was 90, 93 or 94, something like that. And, it was 1993, uh, so yeah. Yeah, and, like, as you say, he doesn't look old, old. Like, he, he might be maybe early 50s here. I don't know. It's hard to pick because you look at Lord of the Rings and that technically started, uh, I think, I can't remember the exact year, but filming didn't start, you know, like in 2000, I think. Um, there was some some of the filming that started in 1999, so yeah, you know, a few years after that, maybe a bit closer to 60, maybe or mid 50s. In this movie, I'm not 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 too sure. You'd, uh, better go in. Will they miss us? It's just a little while longer, I think. It's interesting to think as well that uh, both Helen, Helen and Bonham Carter and Kenneth Branagh, they were both in Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, uh, Branagh played Gilderoy Lockhart. That's what I love about having seen the Harry Potter movies now because I didn't actually see them until um, basically Half-Blood Prince had been out for a while. Uh, so I, I came to the, to the Harry Potter craze late. But I just love in movies now where I see the the, the connections between which actors and actresses have actually been in Harry Potter and also been in heaps of other movies together too. Yeah, and uh, Emma Thompson, she was in Harry Potter as well. She played she played Professor Trelawney, and um, here at the time I, she was actually Kenneth Branagh's wife, but he yeah. started sort of like having an affair with, with Helena Bonham Carter while this film was in production, and and unfortunately him and Emma Thompson they. They both divorced not that long afterwards. <laughs> yeah, which is fair, fair enough. And he was, he was like in a domestic partnership with, I think, Anna Bonham Carter for about six years, and then, and then she uh, became partners with Tim Burton. <laughs> It's funny to think now that uh, technically I'd seen Helena in this movie first before I saw her in Fight Club, even though, you know, I didn't actually know it was her as an actress until I saw Fight Club, if you know what I mean. Like, because I, I completely had no idea that she was even in this. <laughs> That's fair enough.
till our wedding night. Oh, it's Ingle, Ingolstadt that uh, uh, Frankenstein goes to. Um, I think he's originally from originally from Geneva. He doesn't go to Geneva. He's from Geneva, and it's Ingolstadt University he goes to to uh, learn how to be a doctor. Where really he's come. His, his secret ambition, as everyone knows, is to like find the ability to conquer quite literally conquer death. He literally wants to play God, <laughs> and of course we all know it's like. And uh, in this kind of story, where it's like a bit of a science fiction story as well, as well as horror, like we all know what happens whenever someone tries to play God. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't always, you know, go 100% the way that the, the person wanted it to go. This will be perfect. But it makes you think too that, like in life, there's so many things that, you know, in terms of things like the human anatomy and that, that can go wrong. And, um,. You know, you kind of think in movies like this where it's it's dealing with those kind of things with, you know, human body parts and and things too. It's like, how do you know that everything that you've constructed for this creature is actually going to function properly? You know, it could work for, for a week and then something might happen and the limbs might not work anymore, you know? The thing is, uh, Victor, he can only see I think about two steps ahead he's not really sort of thinking about you know what would happen you know what what might happen if he actually succeeds in doing this and he's not really sort of like considering how the creature would probably feel as well because I think the creature hates what it is and hates Victor as well especially as Victor disowns him that's the thing you know it's like uh in terms of his his thought processes too, like the monster's thought processes, you know, to think that he's just going to be some mindless thing that doesn't, or, or at least something that begins to be, starts off as, as weak-minded in a way, and then ultimately, you know, learns things, I think it's quite arrogant to think that, oh yeah, you know, this creature's just going to be easily controlled, and, you know, if I, if I abandon it, it's not going to worry it. You know, it's not going to have any effect on it. I do think Kenneth Branagh was going into a bit of a, a no-win situation. I mean, like hardcore fans of the Frankenstein films beforehand would have, wouldn't have liked this film. I think by 1994, a lot of people wouldn't have been that familiar with the book, which is so they probably wouldn't have known that this would be sort of like more of a faithful adaptation. But uh, uh, Branagh, he just stuck to his guns and said, nope, I'm going to do the film that I want to do. And he still says he's quite proud of his work on it. Actually, it's funny, it made me think, because this is actually, you know, it's got, obviously, Mary Shelley's name is above the title. And I wonder if there were some people that had no idea that she even wrote the novel. You know, and sort of, they, <laughs> they, might, probably they might go, who's Mary Shelley? Well, they might think it's a, a director, like the director of it, or... <laughs> You know, this is Mary Shelley's version of Frankenstein. In fact, that's just the sort of thing I'd expect a perfectly rational person to say to a complete stranger. Henry Clerval, by the way, and I'm completely crazy. Victor Frankenstein of Geneva. Of Geneva. Yes, I know. Why don't you look where I'm going? That's Schiller, ornament of the playing field. Really? He's new as well, you can tell, because he goes around looking at things with his mouth open. And in the book, or at least the version of the book that I read, uh, Frankenstein is a bit more brooding, whereas in this film he's a little bit more energetic. And I mean, I it, uh, this film is sort of like more closer to the book, but obviously it's sort of like uh, made a few changes, like, you know, as any adaptation has to really. So I suppose you could argue as well, like book purists, uh, who are like huge fans of the original book probably wouldn't have liked this film either for the changes that it made. <laughs> yeah, and when I think about that kind of thing, I can understand it from from a point of view of different franchises and things, like that there might be some kind of thing like that, but 
when I look at this movie, I I don't have the other movies in my mind, if you know what I mean, like because I haven't seen them. Even the Christopher Lee ones, I've seen bits and pieces in James Rolfe's reviews of them for Monster Madness, but I've never actually sat down and watched the entire film of of a lot of the Frankenstein movies that have been made. So I sort of don't have this. Well, that's not how it was done in the other ones, sort of thing. And here we have uh, John Cleese playing against type. He's sort of like plays a more serious role as opposed to his more like comedic roles that he's known for, such as Monty Python and Faulty Towers. Excellent. Whereas he's actually surprisingly good here. Yeah, it's interesting when you have actors that people think of as only being uh, one thing and, and finding it hard to accept that they can do something serious. So there's heaps of actors like that, you know, Robin Williams and Jim Carrey even. You know, he's another comedian that people... You know, when he first started doing some serious stuff, thought, Jim Carrey not doing a comedy? What's going on here? He's dark, sleek and beautiful, and always wags her tail whenever she sees me. Her name is Tootsie, and she's the friendliest sheep dog that I've ever known. <laughs> she is still living, all right. Upon your lips to taste, I dream of your arms and of your breast and of the time on our wedding night when we'll be <laughs> oh, his teacher is angry <laughs> because obviously in these days, uh, uh, Christianity was sort of like the big main religion at the time, and and they don't like not a huge kind of like outside thinking and. And Frankenstein is a big outside thinker. He's sort of like thinking outside the box and saying, no, 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 we can do it if we do it like this. And uh, and his teacher, who's sort of like a bit of a fundamentalist, isn't interested in what he has to say. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, not being able to see another alternative way of doing things is, is shutting your yourself off to the possibility of, you know, maybe you could succeed. If you listen to this other point of view. Explain yourself. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Listen, I came here to learn all about the new science, about galvanism, frankness. It's like I, I think that even if ultimately it doesn't sound like something that might work, I think it's you know important to at least try, you know, to to do what a person suggests. Like, oh no, you can't do it that way because that's not the way it's always been done. This is the only way it can be done. And it's like, why? Yeah. Because it's majority people yeah, think that's the only way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, pretty much sums up the, like, the mentality at the time. I mean, it's like, it's, it's why we have a lot of inventions that we have now. It's because people, you know, looked at a different way of, of thinking about things and came up with something new. Like, I don't know if anyone out there is, like, uh, fans of Doug Walker, the Stars Critic, or, or Spoonie, no, no Rantwiler, but uh, <laughs> at the moment I'm thinking of Dr. Insano going, how am I going to conquer death? With science, of course! <laughs> With science! <laughs> Actually, I would actually like to see him do a, a review of, of something Frankenstein, at least. Well, whatever movie it is. That's quite, uh, <laughs> quite grisly. It's, uh, oh, it's a hand. <laughs> I thought it was a, a dead cat or something, but it, uh, okay. he's using, <laughs> he's using electricity to move a hand around. <laughs> Which is basically saying, you know, it is possible.
that makes me think of the first people to do things that you know, we, we take for granted now. Like it's it's like hmm, the first person who had anaesthetic tested on them. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like hmm. I'm kind of glad that we live in a, a day and age where all that sort of stuff was figured out. I'd, I'd hate to be in the early days. But... Hate to be a guinea pig. <laughs> exactly. It's funny actually with this movie because they made a game out of it as well. Oh, did they? I, they I did, didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, I can't remember all the systems it was on, but I think it was, I think it was definitely on the Super Nintendo. Not sure if there was a Mega Drive version, but you played as the monster, of course, and I don't know whatever, what other things they added to it to to expand it a bit more beyond the movie. But yeah, there's a there's a game based on it. They have a sick heart. Wouldn't you give them a healthy one? Impossible. No, it's not impossible. We can do it. We're steps away. And if we can do that, if we can replace one part of a human being, we can replace everything. I think uh, Frankenstein is going to make sort of like the leap that sort of like continue the work that uh, John Cleese's character started. And, and I think uh, John Cleese, his character in this film, he's, he's not willing to sort of like uh, take that leap, which he knows could be potentially dangerous and have serious consequences for everyone. Whereas Frankenstein, he's eccentric and obsessed enough to, I think, to sort of, sort of like uh, <laughs> quite literally sort of like create life in, in its like in its most twisted form. <laughs> oh, definitely. Sort of like he ignores the the warning signs and just basically, you know, doesn't think about those kind of things. And that obviously goes back to what you were saying earlier. Like, he's only really thinking two steps ahead and not thinking of the larger picture of things. You're not sick and tight in me. You've got a pox in it, I hear Sheldon. Pox? They're giving us That's pox. right, pox. It's not pox. It's a vaccine that will prevent a plague in this city. Pox, stop. It's a tiny, harmless amount of anti-smallpox serum. Oh, you just said pox! I said it was harmless. It's a necessary precaution without which this godforsaken city would be immediately put under quarantine. You doctors kill people. I don't care what you say. You're not sticking that in me. Yes, I am. In those days, if you had a disease, you didn't stand that much of a chance. <laughs> no. The odds were very much against you a lot. <laughs> I wonder what lens they're using there. It looks like it might be a fisheye lens or something. I, d I don't know. That just looks like an interesting shot there. Yeah, this is where Frankenstein really sort of like uh, starts to lose it, and I think it's just like his obsession. I guess to the point where he's more than determined to like completely conquer death because he just lost a friend. Yeah. And the, uh, that's that's Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. Yeah, I was just thinking of that actually. I, I didn't notice that till now either. It's interesting because I think in one of the Hammer versions of Frankenstein, he did actually look a lot different to um, the universal classic monster design and I think he sort of had I think he was white actually he was bald and had the stitching like around his head I think uh, I think he had I think he had sort of like dead eyes as well yeah and, 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 and uh, black hair black hair as well I don't think he was bald I think he had black hair Actually, yeah, I think you're right, because that was uh, when Christopher Lee played him. That was it, yeah. Yeah, it was. And, and I think in a lot of people's minds, uh, Peter Cushing uh, was the definitive Frankenstein, whereas for me personally, it's... Uh, 
I like what Branner, uh, Kenneth Branner brings to the role. He's he's younger than when Peter Cushing played the role, which I think means he's able to be like maybe a tad more sort of energetic and just like be more eccentric and sort of like really like get the craziness of, of Frankenstein down. And it's interesting as well because uh, uh, when asked, uh, whenever he's asked or like about how, like the negative reaction that uh, the negative reaction which this film got, and how people didn't really like it that much, and how it still sort of like gets negatively viewed, uh, when asked, like how he feels about. Uh, why people's negative opinions on the film. Uh, Kenneth Branagh says, I don't care. <laughs> he, he, he could, he could give less, less of a shit, to be honest. <laughs> and I just think that's a really good way to be. Because it's like, yeah, okay, yep, all right. It's nothing to... I made the film... I, yeah, I made the film I wanted to make. Um, if, you if you don't like it, well, <laughs> you know, that's your kind of you know choice, really. Well, I think, you know, and even the, the movies that I consider to be really bad, there's going to be someone out there who will like it, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, if there's people that hate this movie, okay, that's fair enough, all right. But there's going to be people that like it. And I think this was produced by Francis Ford Coppola, who also produced and directed uh, Dracula. And I think you can buy uh, the two films, uh, this uh, this film and Dracula in sort of like a, a box set, like a special box set, because they were both produced by Coppola. How interesting it would it have been to see a mummy movie uh, around this time too? They could have had like a triple <laughs> kind of uh, of thing, but of course in 1999 they did the action adventure mummy remake. And the assembled organs must have the appropriate. I don't know if if the mummy films like the Universal Mummy movies are based on any uh, books at all. That's a good question actually because I, I can't remember whether it has or not. Yeah, there's a lot of gruesome scenes in this film. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can see why that. I can see why that would have probably turned some people off. Amniotic fluid is the chief biogenic element. The subject is injected with this. The copper acupuncture needles pierce the flesh at all. Now, see, I, I, I could kind of see people who were sort of not that impressed with the, the uh, first, you know, half an hour of this movie or, or whatnot. When it gets to this stage, they're probably like, oh, cool, you know, finally we're getting to the, the juicy bits. You know, and, the juicy, yeah. you know, and <laughs> I'd probably be the same. You know, when I watched it for the first time, I probably would have um, liked these kind of scenes, but not so much the others. But now, when I'm watching it, I, I appreciate the other scenes a bit more now because you understand, or at least I understand now. Obviously, the um, the context of of him, his his uh, intentions, and all that kind of stuff too. So, it's something extra to appreciate. That that sticking on the head, on the on the creature that <laughs> that always creeps me out just a little bit. <laughs> just imagine seeing that happening in re real life in front of you. Yeah, this looks real. I think, <laughs> like I love practical sets, and then practical special effects and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, there's definitely a certain charm. I, you know, I do hope that. Uh, in the decades to come that practical effects are still used. I mean, CG can be nice, but there's just some things that I think, at least for a basis, you need to have the physical, practical element there. And then, of course, you can build upon it later, but that can go awry too, like with the thing prequel, 
apparently there was a lot of practical stuff that they basically got rid of in, in post. And so it's like, you know, why, why waste time doing it in the first place then if you were just going to go over the top of it and just completely get rid of what was there? Yeah, and I don't think this film does that at all. No. Like, I don't know if there is CGI in this film, but if if it is, then it's implemented quite well. <laughs> yeah, because see, this was obviously after Terminator 2, which had the um, the CG for the uh, T-1000. Yeah, and literally a, a year after Jurassic Park as well. <laughs> yeah. Brain and a jaw. <laughs> yeah. How can you live here like this? And that stench. Don't go in there. We have to leave. It isn't safe. No, I have to stay. And I suppose if you had, like, had any word from someone who you care about and and you came to see them like in this kind of place and he's got like a brain a brain in a jar you would think what's going on oh yeah <laughs> yeah just like what, what the hell's been like going on here i mean like what kind of like twisted like stuff are you wrapped up in here <laughs> yeah so like backs away slowly <laughs> runs out the door It's funny, you know, there's a lot of stories that have the thing where you've got someone that's really uh, gung-ho about what they want to accomplish and, you know, unfortunately, any any sort of other relationships get pushed aside because it's like, no, I want to get this thing done, you know. It's sort of, uh, so I think, I don't know, it, it depends. Like, if you had someone who could understand that, I suppose, but obviously in this story, it's, you know, he becomes so obsessed with his work that, you know, I don't think I don't think there's any woman in this time period that would have been like, yeah, okay, I'll go along with you. But I I really like uh, Elizabeth played by Helen Bonham Carter. She uh, she sort of uh, sort of. Uh, Frankenstein's moral moral compass really and what you, you could argue that like she's what what he could have uh, maybe what he should have if he if he, if he just for a moment just just stop and thought about what he's doing and just just stopped with like this crazy obsession of his and, and just try to lead a normal life I love the music in this scene. As you can see, it's very, it very matches his excitement. <laughs> and I guess too, you know, I think in other versions, like Frank, Victor Frankenstein is more, you know, in this, as you said, he's a bit more energetic. And he's not sort of just wearing, you know, um, very official clothes, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, this is when uh, Brandon was in his prime and he had a six pack. <laughs> and he was always like, when he, yeah, always wanting to show it off for the ladies. <laughs> yeah. And to me, I think it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a good change to have a younger actor playing Frankenstein because... It may be as as an element, which may not have been seen in the other films. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a different way to approach it.
and of course in the story of Frankenstein and all the films and even in the graphic novel version that I read he uses a bolt of lightning to bring his creation to life whereas in this film he uses uh, by the looks of it he uses electric eels <laughs> Which to me makes more practical sense in one way because you never know when and where like a, a bolt of lightning is gonna is gonna strike and it might not ever happen. Hmm. And especially in this, especially in these days, like the the seventeen hundreds, when like there was no like way to like to predict the weather at all. No, just just couldn't predict the weather so so it, it makes more sense to me that that Frankenstein would be clever enough no. to think oh wait no mate look, I'm not going to stand out in the rain waiting for a bolt of, for a bolt of lightning I mean, I'm going to use something that makes practical sense <laughs> yeah otherwise there'd be a lot of scenes of waiting around like I hear thunder quick Yeah, that's, that's one change to the story that I think is quite good. It's alive. It's alive! <laughs> Is it going to be a jump scare? Yep. yep. <laughs> And it's interesting as well because uh, uh, Danny Boyle, he, a couple of years ago, he did, I think it was like a stage musical version of Frankenstein, and he took like a lot of elements uh, from this film, and he did it. And you can, like his his like version of the creature looks a lot looks a lot similar to to how the the monster looks in this film. You succeeded in what you wanted to do. You brought you, you brought you know someone dead back to life. <laughs> now I pay the consequences. Like yeah, there's a I'd like to put a defect notice on this monster on this creature. Um. Some have said that the story doesn't work as well because there's more focus on Frankenstein. It's like, well, isn't Frankenstein the one that's sort of like the central nub of the whole thing? Isn't he the one who's who's driving the story forward? Yeah, and, you know, it is named after him.
Yeah, I don't know really. I mean, what do you want to do? Sort of like just look at the the amount of screen time he gets and then compare it to how much the monster gets and you know do that kind of thing. It's like you know, we followed this character up until you know now um, where the monster hasn't been in existence yet. And I don't know how long it takes in the uh, the other version for that to happen, but you know, at least we've spent a bit of time with this this character before all this happens. But I think sometimes you have to take time to to develop these things in the in the movie. Oh. <laughs> that made me jump a little bit when when he wakes up and he sees the monster standing in the room. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. You know, you're just in your room and then all of a sudden this, this creature comes at you. Now it's funny the whole idea with how he, you know, spoiler if you haven't seen this, uh, how Frankenstein's monster ends up with the um, the old man. Is isn't he blind in this? Uh, yeah, he is. Uh, yeah. The old man who, who helps the creature is blind. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I don't know how many other movies that's been used in and other stories, but I know something similar is in one of the Halloween movies. Apparently, apparently, I I think it might be. Um, I'll probably get shot for people who actually know these later sequels, but I think it might be five or six. I think it was Halloween five, and um, he, Michael Myers ends up with this old man, except he's not blind, but he sort of is there for for a year, I think, just basically staying with this old man in his shack. Uh, it is Halloween five, uh, Rod. You were right about that. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Get him, get your pitchforks, get the torches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as but I think even today, if you did see that, just walking around the streets, you would sort of be a bit afraid, I think. Well, I think the first thing people would do is bring out their smartphone and take <laughs> take some video footage of it. Then it would be trending on Facebook and on Twitter. Yeah, like monster. <laughs> then you have monster rights activists coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> monster rights activists. It's like, yes, he's throwing people around and he's badly injuring people, but he just wants to be loved. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> And some people say they don't like this film because it makes you feel sorry for the monster, whereas in other versions that isn't what happens. And but I don't really see how that's a problem, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue. I mean, so far it doesn't seem to be like it's overindulging in that kind of thing. Like, it's not sort of in your face about it. Bring out your dead. <laughs> Couldn't help but think of that. There now. Easy. Easy. That's it. Oh. There now. Rest me. Of course I'm here. It was touch and go with you, though. Spitmore? I feared cholera. Turned out to be pneumonia. 
Yes, I'm becoming something of a doctor. Even Cramp seems pleased with me. At this rate, I might even pass it now. The, the epidemic is dreadful. There's nothing to cure for. The vulnerable anyone. Now, do you actually know who this actor is? Because I've been trying to place him. Every time I see him on camera, I'm thinking, who who is this guy? And where have I seen him before? Oh, well, that's that's Tom Hulse. He played the Tarzan role in Amadeus, which is like the story of uh, Wolfgang. Sorry, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, or was it Amadeus? Yeah, Mozart. The story of Mozart, the composer. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen that one, so I wonder where I'm. Or maybe he has a face that looks similar to some other actor. <laughs> And in a minute, Frankenstein is going to realise, oh shit, there's a there's a thing I created running about the place. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, what do you think of uh, Kenneth Kenneth Branagh in this role, uh, Rod? I think he's doing a really good job. I I haven't seen anything in his performance or anything like that that's made me think he's a terrible choice for the character. I mean. You know, he seems to be doing it well, and yeah, he always yeah. takes every role. He, he always takes every role he does uh, quite seriously. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Try and forget about what happened, and maybe try and live that normal life he he probably should have had. But uh, but I like how we see uh, the journey the creature goes through because in the version of the, version of the book I read, it's like all told like through flashbacks from the perspective of the creature. Whereas in this film, we see the journey the creature goes through as it unfolds, which I think was a good change to make. Instead of like turning it all in like one big exposition and in like one long flashback that would have probably gone on for too long. <laughs> yeah, I think you know for for a novel it, it works, but I think for a movie, you know, you definitely can't just have you know the entire thing be flashbacks. But yeah, you're you're experiencing what the monster, you know, his journey as he goes. So it's feeling like something is happening rather than, oh, this is what happened. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed the graphic novel. I did really enjoy reading it, but uh, but uh, I, I can accept I can accept the changes that uh, the changes to the story that they made. Because to me, if it makes more sense from a narrative point of view, then do it. Because if it makes if it benefits the story, then then do it because it because it benefits the story. I mean, if if there's something there which doesn't benefit the story, then don't do it. You know, and that's which is like the basic rule of any uh, free act structure, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, the story that we're we're seeing here is, you know, obviously one of um, a man's obsession going you know a long way and and then you have this creature who starts to learn to do things and 
you know, he's learning without the help of uh, the man who created him. So, you know, if you're telling that kind of story, it, it makes sense not to have Frankenstein literally, you know, having scenes with the monster going, okay, this is how you read a book, you know, this is how you do this. You know, so Frankenstein's effectively finding out stuff on his own. And the old man in this is played by uh, Richard Richard Bryars, who was f- factored in films for about 50 odd years, actually. And he did a lot of Shakespeare. Worked with, uh, worked with uh, Frankenstein quite a few times. Sorry, worked with Frankenstein. Worked with, yeah. I mean, worked with Kenneth Branagh quite a few times on various films. Cool. I think too, like you, you said before about um, you know people not liking that they give, they make you feel sympathetic towards uh, Fr- the Frankenstein's monster, and you know obviously for me like I, I don't think that's a, an issue, but the other aspect that you got to remember too is that there's also empathy as well. So you can sort of look at the Frankenstein monsters and empathise with him too in certain moments. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I really like the makeup on uh, Robert De Niro as well. Um, this, I think this is... Uh, well, actually, no, I think the thing about Robert De Niro is whenever you generally see him... You see him in a film, you kind of like instantly know it's him, whereas this is this is one of those films where it's a role he quite literally gets completely disappears into. So I'm never... I'm never always thinking in the back of my mind, oh, it's Robert De Niro. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's really getting into it, and you do forget, like, I have to remind myself sometimes, yeah, he did play, like, you know, thinking about him being in it at all, you know, sometimes I have to stop and think, oh, yeah, that's right, he did play Frankenstein once. Yeah, I think the makeup and the design and the look of, of Frankenstein's monster in this is, is really cool. Children. I think it would look stupid if it was the Boris Karloff version walking around in this setting and like in, in the way that this movie yeah. is made. <laughs> yeah, sort of like um he's sleeker and right. lot sleeker and less less cumbersome. Yeah. And people are like, oh, that's not the traditional image of what the Frankenstein monster is. It's like, well, this is this is a different take. And and if and if you don't like it just because it's different, then well, you know, I don't know what to say to you. Well, and and the other thing too is like, you know, for me, I haven't read the book. So, but when when I hear you say that some people said, yeah, it's not the original image, I can't help but think, have they read the book? Because I don't think, you know, even though I haven't read the book, I'm pretty sure it's not described the way that it's done in the Boris Karloff version. Well, in the graphic novel I read, there's quite a few, like, cool images of how the monster looks. And he, and in this film, Robert De Niro doesn't look anything like how he looked in the graphic novel. Whereas me, I honestly don't really care, to be honest. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I would have maybe preferred sort of like maybe something like close to how the monster looks in that version but uh, you know I'm not going to sort of like you know it's not something to complain about really to be honest I mean if I did that would just be nitpicking yeah I think nitpicks are things that are you know they're, they're just yeah okay yeah you, you notice the nitpicks but they're like continuity errors you know sometimes continuity errors don't matter 
you know, it's like who cares if in one shot, you know, there's a, a, a teapot that's in one position facing one way, then the next shot, you know, it's facing a different way. You know, who gives a shit? <laughs> it's, it's like as long as what's happening in the scene in terms of the narrative and the acting is, is going fine. Yeah, which is why I like how in, instead of uh, flashbacks, we see sort of like both sides of the story. We see both Frankenstein's story and we see the monster's story sort of like unfolding and sort of like, and it'll get to the point as well where they'll in, intersect as well. Yeah. But of course, uh, Frankenstein is thinking in the back of his mind, uh, where is that thing? I need to find that thing and, and kill it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, you, you've got to, you'll have to face up to it eventually. It's not something that she can just, you know, go on as if it never happened. I guess that's the lesson too in this. It's like, you know, if you, you've got to take responsibility for your actions. And if you don't, you know, there may come a time where you're actually forced to accept responsibility. I mean, it's not like he can blame someone else for the monster being in existence. You can't say, well, it was so-and-so, you know, they did it. Like, no, he did it, and uh, he's going to have to face up to it when the monster you know comes comes back to him yeah yeah exactly and I guess the other thing too I just thought of is the way that the monster's going about things now you know if if Frankenstein had actually persevered with him you know, and he got to this point, then, you know, maybe he'd have a different feeling about the monster. Oh, it's you. What have you done to Maggie? Is he in there? Hiding behind a blind old man? Get away! Get away! Don't blame me. Blame your son for not paying his rent on time. Won't you come and sit by the fire? Now it's interesting this, you know, you look at the, the guy, the man who's blind. It's like, you know, he doesn't see see the monster, so he's not thinking, you know, how grotesque is this person. You know, he's just taking him based on the, um, you know, the, the action that he did and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, he just helped him and... And he's sitting down and talking to him, and and the monster's probably thinking, uh, you know, this is the first time like anyone's ever sat down and spoke, spoken to me like as a normal human being ever since this happened to me. Yeah. Why? And this is pretty much how it happened in the graphic novel that I read. Uh, I think. The blind man, he gets, he gets attacked by someone, the monster helps him, and they sit down and talk to one another. And then the, the family rushes in and sees him and, and, and casts him back out. And it also shows, you know, the intelligence that the creature has too. And of course, you know, I'm sure they'll think that he was the one that did whatever the other guy was doing. (laughs) 
very very good like sort of makeup design on uh, Robert De Niro as well. <laughs> yeah. Just completely lost, completely lost in in that role and. Maybe this this kind of like came out of left field for quite a few people who are who are fans of uh, Robert De Niro. It's like he's not swearing, he's not, you know, pointing a gun at someone, he's not, <laughs> you know, doing those kinds of things. You talking to me, you know, those sorts of things. He's not doing any of that. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, him being a method actor, I would I would imagine like he would have quite enjoyed, quite enjoyed like really getting into this role. Oh yeah. Another movie that he was in that I really recommend people see is Awakenings, which also starred Robert uh, Robin Williams. Rest in peace. Um, he was in it too. He played a a real life man, Oliver Sacks, who actually passed away recently too. That uh, Robert De Niro plays the um, one of the patients that. Robin Williams' character Oliver Sacks actually um, deals with. Like, I think he realizes, uh, oh, I know who who did this. I've got to find him. And these experiments are at an end. <laughs> Going after Frankenstein now. <laughs> he is. He's on a mission to get revenge against the man who created him. <laughs> Frankenstein, the action movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think this film has got really good cinematography as well. Like every every scene just has just got like a good color palette to it. Yeah, I was thinking that earlier too in the film with a lot of um of the locations too and, and even the sets, like especially that inside of the set where you had the big staircase. That was quite an interesting um design. And of course now, uh, Victor's come home, come back home with Elizabeth, and they're planning on getting married. <laughs> yeah, doing the big end. And uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say what happens, but uh, let's just say that uh, this does not end well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Me personally, I would love to act in a film like this, you know, like period dress. I'd love to sort of like wear 1700s era clothing. I just think that would just, it just looks like fun. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the creatures arrived in the area where, where Victor lives. Yeah, he's in his hood, so to speak. 
track he'd started. He knows he's on the right track. Is he back yet? Yeah, me personally, I'm looking forward to seeing a uh, a TV series that's coming out next month called The Frankenstein Chronicles, which stars Sean Bean as a detective investigating a series of brutal murders. And I'm not entirely sure what take the story is going to have because uh, there's Mary Shelley, the writer of the original story, is in that series as well as a character. And I don't know if if the story is going to be about uh, like people bringing the dead back to life, or if it's going to be sort of like inspired how how Mary Shelley like wrote the story of Frankenstein. But in either case, it does look really good, and and I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when th they do things nowadays. You kind of think, you know, what sort of angle are they going to take on it? And uh, I wonder if uh, Sean Bean will actually die for the first time in a in a series or movie in that series. <laughs> Because he's he's never died in a movie before as a character, right? No, no, sure, Ben. He he always lives. He he um he, he's quite known for uh, always surviving at the end of a movie, actually. <laughs> oh, that's right, he too. Yeah. Maybe in an alternate universe, but we all know that he dies quite a lot in his movies. <laughs> yeah. For those for those people who thought we were being serious. And uh, now Frankenstein's father, uh, Baron Frankenstein, is uh, starting to go mad. <laughs> yeah. He's just still out looking for William. That's such a tragedy. He started badly. I was cruel to him. I didn't mean it. I hope she thinks it's very hard now with your wedding. She loves you dearly. I, I couldn't bear if anything happened to you. She's all I've got. Please help me. We'll organize another search now that it's light. You'll find where Mrs. Murray is, I promise. How is Baba? It's hard to speak. Mr. Frankenstein, we've apprehended the murderer not five miles from here, hiding in a... And, uh... Uh, Kenneth Branagh is one of those directors who's always had quite a bit of clout. All of his films have, like, impressive cast members. I mean, obviously, this one has Tom Hulse, C. C. Imry, uh, John Cleese, Robert De Niro, Helena Bonham Carter, Ian Holm. <laughs> Oh, the film does. Uh, I'm, I apologise for what I said earlier. The film does have that element to the story where Frankenstein's sister is is tried for for doing something wrong, and she gets she she quite tragically gets tragically gets executed for it. And it's such such a sad element to the story. It's, it's actually one of my favourite. I mean, I know that's kind of strange to say that. A sad element of the story is one of my favorite elements of the story, but this was one of my favorite elements in the graphic novel because 
it's just so sad and sudden and and uh, adds a lot of sort of like a twist and a lot of like character development to Frankenstein and really just kind of just just like you know it's just such a so just adds more to the story as well I think and and I'm so glad I'm so glad that the film left that in as well we cut her down so we can bury her in the morning thank you Claude get to bed so yeah I <laughs> I completely forgot that uh, about, about that to be honest and <laughs> yeah, um, uh, apologies for that. I, I had a complete brain fart. <laughs> That's okay, I don't think there'll be a lynch mob after you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I am definitely um, sort of pleased that uh, uh, Branna didn't cut that part of the story out and left it in. <laughs> Because what that does is, it makes Frankenstein realise that it's kind of reached the point now where what he's done is just going to start having like more and more consequences for all those he cares about, and he has to sort of now he's sort of like got to go all like on a mission like to stop the creature and just sort of like destroy what he created once and for all. Yeah, he's finally got to the point where he's forced to deal to deal with it. And I do distinctly remember in this part of the story where, where Frankenstein uh, climbs to the top of the mountain, like to meet the monster. Whereas in the graphic novel, he doesn't meet the monster beforehand. The monster finds him on top of the mountain. But again, if it makes sense from a narrative standpoint, then just do that change. <laughs> Actually, interesting. What's going to happen with um, the um, classic monsters like Frankenstein and the Mummy? Because they have a planned universe, just like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And at one point, they, I think, they're going to turn it into like an action adventure franchise. Yeah. So I, I don't know how it's going to work with Frankenstein if they do go that route. I mean, maybe there's a way to do a contemporary story of Frankenstein, but I don't know how you could turn it into like an action adventure thing. Uh, well, from what I've seen, the Frankenstein Chronicles, which I mentioned earlier, looks like it's gonna sort of like be contemporary, even though it's set in uh, Victorian London. I used Google. <laughs> I used Google. <laughs> 1794. <laughs> yeah. No. You murdered my brother, didn't you? I took him by the throat. One hand. Yeah, Frankenstein feels as though he doesn't owe him anything. I think this is a really good scene. Well directed, well acted. Who were these people of which I am comprised? 
Yeah, it really draws you in. Good people. Bad people. I like the score by Patrick Patrick Dawn as well. I mean, he often quite worked with uh, Kenneth Branagh quite a few times as well. Yeah, I wonder if he worked with him on um, the uh, Jack Ryan movie that, that, that he directed. Uh, he probably did. <laughs> Uh, have you seen the uh, Jack Ryan movie, uh, Rod? I haven't, no, and I, I don't really... I, it's funny because um, I quite like the Patriot Games movie, Clear and Present Danger and Hunt for Red October, even The Sum of All Fears, when Ben Affleck played Jack Ryan. I, I also like that, but I don't know about this new one because from reviews, people said it, it, it was... They kind of made it more like a, a, a Jason Bourne type thing with the character. But uh, not having seen it myself, I, I can't really speak to that much, but I'll probably get around to seeing it one day. Because those other movies weren't really, you know, action action y type movies. They did have action in them, of course, but there was a lot of stuff about character and and setting the tone of things. Um, oh, of course, uh, what the monster was once uh, from his <laughs> from his father, so to speak, is a is a bride for himself. And and I think um, if if uh, Victor just sort of like dropped his pride just a little bit, he probably realised that if he just gave the creature what he wants, then the creature would just leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. Just doesn't seem to think about that. <laughs> There's actually a um, series of movies called Reanimator, and the second one is actually called Bride of Reanimator, which obviously takes a lot from Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> so he sort of makes a female sort of version. Characters found a way to bring the dead back to life through a serum. It's interesting as well because uh, you must help me. Uh, hang on, I'll get it. <laughs> uh, uh, I know what I want to say. Give me a second. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's interesting as well because uh, Hamlet is a character, a Shakespearean character, who suffers from obsession and never really sort of like thinks about the consequences of his actions and Hamlet was a character that Kenneth Branagh played previously beforehand on the stage and not long after this he went on to make his his film adaptation of Hamlet so I can't help but wonder if uh, if maybe Branagh sort of like bringing his like uh, Shakespearean background to the character Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, it's sort of like taking um, sort of traits of a character that's um, inherent in one and seeing how it can be, you know, how it's in another too and just using that as an experience type thing. God forgive me.
<laughs> She's closing stuff, he's opening it up. Yeah, she wants to leave him, and I suppose I can't really blame her in one way because she's had enough. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. Stuff is. It's interesting as well because I think uh, Kenneth Branner in this film, he would sort of like uh, been more closer age wise. Uh, to how Frankenstein originally was in the original story. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, I guess, old older actors like uh, Peter Cushing uh, playing the role. I mean, obviously Peter Cushing is is, is great as Frankenstein, but uh, but at the same time, I, I can't help but think um, uh, something like this is maybe a, a, a tad refreshing. Yeah, I mean, I kind of think of it like it's like, is it that much of a big deal, really? Like, <laughs> to have him be be younger. I mean, it's not like he's a ten-year-old. <laughs> they, they didn't go that extreme. Nothing more. Have a ten-year-old yeah. Frankenstein being a, a prodigy and coming up with this way to bring dead people back to life. Yeah, and uh, in story, the version of the story I read, uh, the monster decides. Oh, actually, no. I think it's Frankenstein who, who like, like decides that he's going to use parts of his of his dead sister to <laughs> sort of like make a bride, make a bride for the monster. Whereas, obviously, in this film, it's the monster who says, "Oh, I want you to use your sister." <laughs> yeah. It's like it gets the same result, but it's just a different, different, you know different character pushing for it to be that way. Which I, I you know, I, I think of Lord of the Rings and, you know, there's certain lines that were said by characters in the book but are given to different characters in the movie, but, you know, they're, they're used, I think, in a context that suits. So it's kind of like, you know, it's, well, I don't think it's a thing to get upset over. <laughs> Not really, no. Same with, you know, who saves Frodo, you know, to take him to Rivendell. You know, in the book, it's uh, Glorfindel. You know, in the Bakshi thing, it's Legolas. And in the Lord of the Rings movies, it's Arwen. You know, it doesn't really affect much. You know, Frodo still gets to Rivendell. <laughs> yeah, and obviously in this film, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's still... Um, like Frankenstein's unfortunately like deceased sister who's going to be used as the basis for uh, that's going to be used as the basis for Frankenstein uh, the, the creature's bride that's it I mean it's not like the the monsters decided not it's going to be you know Elizabeth who's going to get you know killed and then used but imagine that you know imagine what kind of revenge that would be you know on, on, on Frankenstein's like no. Nah, you know, I'm going to make you kill your, your, you know, the woman you wanted to marry, and then you know have her become my bride. <laughs> that would have probably added a bit more of a darker, even darker element to the story. But I don't know how that would play out. Well, Rod, you haven't seen this film for a while, have you? <laughs> no. Well, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's just say that you're onto something there. <laughs> but at the same time, I think you have to remember that this story is sort of like a, uh, a, uh, a gothic tragedy. And I think if you go into it with that mindset, instead of just like looking for like your, your traditional like scary horror monster film, then I think there is something to sort of like be appreciated here. There is, and sometimes I think that a response that you have to a movie, you might watch it one day and you might be like, eh, I don't know if I like it. But you might watch it another day, and because you've maybe something happened that day that, you know, 
um, changes your mind. Like you might be watching the movie in a different light. You might be more receptive to it. So I think, you know, maybe it's one of these movies that should be given another chance if someone's only seen it, you know, years and years and years ago. Just to give it another look. They might not change their mind, but maybe they will. And I think that's a good thing, like, when it comes to changing your opinion on a movie, I think it's good if it comes naturally, like, if you watch a movie and don't like it, and then someone does like it, and then you change your mind just because the person that, you know, likes it, likes it. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a fake thing, you know. But if you generally watch it again and go, you know what, I actually like this movie now. I think it's better. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. The last ferry's gone. There's nothing now till morning. I'll ride on ahead and secure your lodgings for the night. Thank you, sir. Come on. I must say though, I have liked this movie better now. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think um, it's one of those films that gets on fairly bust. I just think that people have been unfair towards it, and uh, uh, and I think that the fact that Kenneth Branagh he he still feels as though feels as though he's quite proud of this film. I think it's something to be respected because. It was his film. <laughs> Every single decision he made was his own. No one, no one said to him, "Oh, you've got to do this, do that. You've got to have the monster to do this or whatever." It was just like, yeah, no, he's not. He hasn't blamed anyone else for how it turned out. He just, you know, he just he, he still stands by it and doesn't really care if people don't like it or not. It just, you know, he feels as though it's, you know, I, I think he's one of those directors who decides if he did a, a good job or not and. And he he maintains that uh, he that uh, he's the work he did on this film was quite good. Yeah, I think it's actually a good attitude to have because I think it frees them up to um, you know move on to other projects too. Like if you know the director does a movie that people say is terrible, and then they do another one that's really good, you know it's good if the director can feel like they can just go to the next project and you know they might find more success. Yeah, this film is also a bit of a love story as well. Yeah, it's certainly got that element to it. So I guess you could argue that uh, one reason why people don't like this film is it, it just wasn't what they were expecting. And, and well, isn't it a good thing when the film kind of subverts your expectations and does something good in a different way. Yeah, and it's another thing where there's been so many iterations of, of this story. It's like, why not do one that's a bit truer to their source material? He is the sound of the flute and he knows what that is. <laughs>
Please don't hurt me. Oh. Yeah, I, I always feel sorry for Elizabeth. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I keep my promises. Yeah, this entire third act is is quite suspenseful and uh, just never lets up, really. Yeah. Yeah, he's got nothing left now, he's just... Gonna go for it. It does make you think... Like... If you could bring someone back from the dead, like... Let, let's just say that you could, okay? Now... Personally, it would probably be ideal if the person had just died and it was from something that wasn't, you know, gruesome, if you know what I mean. Like, I, uh, it's kind of hard to sort of put it in black and white terms, but, um, you know, I, I think in certain circumstances, like, uh, I don't know if bringing the person back for them would really be much of a benefit. Exactly, yeah, um, they might want to stay dead, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like, for what's happened here with Elizabeth, like, if she was brought back to life and, you know, had that big hole in the chest and all, all this, like, would she want to, to live with that deformity? I, I just don't know. It's interesting as well, because, uh, uh, in the original uh, story, well, at least the version that I read, it's not Elizabeth who Frankenstein brings back to life. It's his sister. Now that's a, a pretty good no scream. Instead of something like Revenge of the Sith, it was like, no. <laughs> and just to go on a tangent for a second too, like when Luke yells out no in A New Hope, when Obi-Wan Kenobi dies, like I've always thought that was a, a pretty good, you know, no, that's not a, you know, a, un, an unintentionally humorous one. Yeah, I mean, uh, Frankenstein still hasn't learned. <laughs> no. Say my name. Yes, I think the, the whole point of learning a lesson is that uh, you know not to do it again. Yeah. Um, uh, spoilers, uh, unfortunately, he's the love of his life. He's going to have to die twice in this story before he finally 
<laughs> sort of realises where he went wrong. Yeah. Which I, I think is really sad. But it's just, you know, you have to, you have to lose a woman you love twice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, Elizabeth can't go on living like this. <laughs> no. But that's an element to the story I never really fully realised before, just the fact that uh, <laughs> Frankenstein loses <laughs> his love twice. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just think that's really good storytelling, personally. Yeah, I mean, this movie definitely has a lot of layers to it. It's not just a, a one-note story. It's all like a bit of a twisted grotesque scene where he's dancing with a reanimated Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. Really good makeup jobs in this. Yeah, I mean, for me, practical effects trump CGI every time. Yeah, you'd really do a very bad number on this in CG. Yeah, that uh, revenge that you mentioned earlier, Rod, has uh, in one way kind of come true. <laughs> yeah. What have you done to me, Victor? Oh, I think she would hate him for it as well. Yeah. I guess the other way you could look at it too is he was, you know, he, he brought her back to life at selfishness. Definitely. I mean, he's, he's definitely a selfish character. Um, like, his selfishness, I think, is always sort of like being like the main driver of this story. Yeah. <laughs> yep, Elizabeth dies twice in this story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, one Which of those is just it's like yeah. <laughs> Which is for me just like just completely sums up the madness of this whole kind of tale. Just 
<laughs> and now his house is burning down. <laughs> well, uh, have you ever seen Pet Cemetery? Uh, I haven't, no. Uh, I won't say anything more then. <laughs> I was just gonna, I was just going to talk about something that might be be spoilers somewhere along the line, but just reminded me of that movie. But yeah, this is quite a tragic thing that he's lost. Lost his wife. Well, for me, I I think it just like as you said, it adds more layers if the story is more tragic, and <laughs> it quite literally took uh, Frankenstein's love to die twice, okay, twice <laughs> in this yeah. story for him to realise. Oh wait, no, hang on a second, maybe what I was doing was wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one thing to sort of think of the positives of bringing people who are dead you know, back to life, but it's like you've got to think of other things besides that too. It's kind of like, you know, what what could go sour if you are successful? <laughs> you know, it's not always going to, it's not all going to be sunshine and roses after doing it. No, it's not. Me, me personally, it's it's not something I would ever want to try because for me, it would just like completely go against the natural order of things. And I think like, and, and I do personally feel that uh, like this whole story is sort of like like a warning against anyone who wants to who wants to try and just like. Could mess up the natural order and natural balance and think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll play God, I'll, I'll conquer death. Yeah, conquer death. <laughs> which is sort of, uh, mate, just, just one of those things which I don't think should be messed with at all. No. It's funny, this actor here reminds me of Terry Gilliam. I'm sorry, but whenever I, I hear things like this, you know, in funerals and, and that in the movies, I can't help but think of Highlander 2 where Katana is sort of saying, like, um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If you're not around to use them, they're going to rust. I hate that film. <laughs> and, I hate, and I hate it whenever you remind me of that film as well. I mean, just like... If we, if we ever do a commentary on Highlander 2, I, I don't think I'd, my, my mental sanity would survive. <laughs> well, we, we, we could do one first on the source and then do Highlander 2. Yeah, we could do, yeah. And of course, the uh, the ice is breaking, which is going to free up the ship and allow them to keep, keep sailing on. And I think, yeah, the creature dies as well.
he's got to symbolically burn the body of his father. <laughs> Give a Viking funeral. Toasty. And again, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, uh, why do people people hate this film again? <laughs> it's just such a. It, it's got a good beginning, second, and third act. Yeah, I don't really understand why it's it's hated. I mean, hate hate is a very strong word to use for a film. Uh, I'd use it for things like Mortal Kombat Annihilation, um, <laughs> which is which is more than understandable to be honest, because that film is crap. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say this movie falls into the hate category. I mean, me, me, if I was to uh, say anything, oh, I'd say um, I would have preferred it if the... Maybe just slightly preferred it if the creature had been more in line in how I saw him in the graphic novel. And... Maybe the film could have, like... That's been paced a little bit better, but aside from that, I don't really... <laughs> don't really have that many criticisms to level against it. I mean... I'm... And, and I just can't help but applaud and... Uh, Kenneth, Branagh, Kenneth Branagh's work on it. Oh, absolutely. And I didn't realise that Frank Darabont had something to do with this too. Yeah, he wrote, yeah, he wrote the screenplay. Awesome. So, uh, uh, what are your general thoughts then, uh, Rod? Okay, well, my general thoughts on this movie is that I think it's a, it's a pretty good uh, movie, actually. And I enjoyed it a lot more on this viewing, being an adult now and being able to um, appreciate um, other aspects of this movie that I didn't notice before, which is, of course, you know, things about obsession that um, Frankenstein has and those sorts of themes. And, yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, Robert De Niro does a pretty cool job as the Frankenstein's monster and... I like the design, the makeup work, and that kind of thing. A lot of good actors, and uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd definitely give this a, a really good rating. I'd probably give this a um, eight out of ten. Me, I'd probably give it like a four point five out of five. And uh, I understand if uh, if it wasn't sort of like people's tastes, but uh, but I think if you judge it purely on its own terms, then there is sort of like a a film to be respected and Kenneth Branagh is quite proud of his work on it and I love the score by Patrick Doyle I love just about every single actor in it <laughs> and for me it's just just one of those films where it's not a masterpiece I mean I'm not saying it is but it's just a good take on the uh, Frankenstein tale um, and that's it for uh, Horror Month now I mean I don't think we're going to be able to fit in any more we would have done more but um, I wasn't able to do uh, many more for various health reasons but uh, we hope you enjoyed the ones that we did do and uh, we'll see you next year absolutely and uh, yeah go check out our other audio commentaries that we've done throughout October and uh, look forward to more um, before this year is out and next year as well definitely yeah so this is Amadeus Red and Rogeri signing off adios <laughs>